Israeli LSA security or defense doctrine. Uh, it is, of course, related to many specific events, but I will try to explain to you uh, the general principles uh, and the evolving of these principles, because uh, when the State of Israel was established, or at least until 67, we had some kind of, uh, let's say, national concept. Many things have changed since then. And uh, part of the uh, of the explanation was based on more, let's say, political, strategic, general, geographic um, uh, explanations. And some of them will be uh, purely military explanations. And again, we are not a military academy. I'm not going to speak about, let's say, these matters in depth, because I already told you I love to speak about tactics. That's what I did most of my life in the military. But uh, it's important to try to understand not necessarily the, 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 the tactics of the military, but the principles or even the philosophy of the uh, tactical thinking, which is important because many times this is the explanation why certain action was taken and other actions were not taken. So it is important to try to understand. Uh, when the state of Israel was established back in 48 and short time after that, uh, David Ben Gurion was the first Israeli prime minister. He actually was the first one who wrote an official paper and he called it the defense doctrine of the state of Israel. And he said that there should be three main principles. Uh, the three main principles are number one, uh, our, uh, we have to be able to deter enemies and potential enemies. Why? Because contrary to many, many other countries that were in period of wars, wars, but in the end of the day managed to reach some reconciliation or peace or agreements uh, or compromises with their neighbors, we live and still unfortunately live, but this is certainly true if I'm speaking about periods of 76 years ago, in an environment that actually does not accept us an environment that is looking to find a way to uh, to attack us or even to eliminate us. So if we fail to deter enemies or potential enemies, uh, it means that we will not be able to survive because we will be in a continuous military uh, struggle or in you know, continuous uh, military conflicts. So the very first principle is to be able to deter enemies and potential enemies. Now, this is essential, I would say, for every country, but for us, as I try to explain, is critical. And in order to deter enemy, you have to project power. You have to show uh, not only that you do have certain military uh, capabilities, this is a precondition, of course, but also you have to uh, project uh, the uh, the willingness uh, to use this uh, uh, force. In other words, that's fine. Um, in other words, uh, the ability, a military abilities is not enough if the other side uh, believes that you are uh, too afraid, too reluctant, too weak to make the right decisions whenever it, need, it is needed. I'll give you this example, not from Israel, but from other country, Saudi Arabia. About four and a half years ago, because if I'm not wrong, in September 2019, Aramco, which is the biggest oil industry in the world, this is a national oil industry of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia relies, of course, on on this industry more than on anything else. Uh, all the facilities, or many of the facilities of this huge uh, company were attacked simultaneously by dozens of cruise missiles and UAVs that were launched by the pro-Iranian militias from Iraq, from the north, the north of Saudi Arabia, and Yemen, in the south of, uh, of, uh, from, of uh, Saudi Arabia. And the uh, damage was very significant. About 50% of the oil production 
of, uh, uh, of Saudi Arabia. It was interrupted. It is true that they managed to fix it and to recover in a few days, but nevertheless, it was a very, very painful attack against Saudi Arabia. Now you can expect a country like Saudi Arabia, a very big country, a very rich country, country that is equipped with the best American uh, military uh, 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 air force uh, to retaliate against those who attack them. But the Saudi's reaction was actually the opposite. It is not only that they did not respond, but actually uh, as a result of such an attack, they decided to try to, let's say, to uh, reach some kind of reconciliation with Iran. In a way, they had to, uh, uh, to give up a lot in order to persuade the Iranian to agree to resumption of, uh, of, uh, of uh, diplomatic relations between two countries. In other words, Saudi Arabia projected in this event exactly the opposite of what is needed in order to deter enemies of potential enemies. And uh, that's why we are not surprised to see that similar attacks continue to be against them. So uh, the ability, uh, the military abilities are not enough. So the, in order to deter, you have to be ready to take risks and to show that you are not afraid. One of the examples, which is a good Israeli example from the past, I would say, 10 years, is what Israel is doing in Syria today. Uh, in Syria, uh, about 12 years ago, uh, a civil war began between the regime, regime of Bashar Assad, and different kind of groups of opposition. Some of them were ISIS, some other were just ordinary Sunnis that uh, were against the regime. The regime is not Sunni, the regime is of Alawin, which is minority of Syrian that actually control the country. Some other oppositions were grouped that were strongly supported at that time by the United States and others. So a real civil war began. And the uh, Bashar uh, regime in the end of the day managed to succeed and to win because ironically, they received the support of the West and the East simultaneously. The Americans helped them because the Americans or other Western countries did support them because the NATO forces fought against ISIS in Syria, but they helped the regime because it was the regime against a group of other uh, 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 cluster of many, many other enemies. So actually, even if it was not the intent, the Americans helped Bashar Assad. But those who helped them much more were the Iranian and the Russians. And uh, Iran helped them uh, mainly by uh, not only supplying of weapons, but also by sending forces to fight with Bashar Assad, with the regime of Syria. And most of the forces were Hezbollah forces from Lebanon, that is actually an Iranian proxy, and thousands of them were sent to Syria to fight for the regime in Syria. Now, why the Iranian did it? The Iranian did it not because they were so nice to Syria, and not only because they wanted the, that regime will sustain, but also because the Iranian had a long-term uh, plan, and according to what I already told you, and we will return to this matter probably in some other opportunities, Iran wanted and still wants to create a ring of fire against uh, around Israel and to be able at some point to attack Israel from all directions. So they do have Hezbollah in the north, they do have or they did have Hamas in the south, there are some other forces in the region, but they said why won't we Iranian establish in Syria a similar strong militia that will be, uh, that eventually will become to be as strong as Hezbollah in Lebanon. So if Israel faced today a very significant or severe threat from Lebanon, the Iranian plan 10 years ago was to establish a similar militia in Syria, what we call in Israel uh, Hezbollah too. And they began to take all the actions in order to do it. They arranged 
a group of volunteers from many, many Shia communities, from Iran itself, from Lebanon, from Afghanistan, from other places. Of course, they could equip them with very, very advanced Iranian weapons. They began to train them, and it began to be a real growing threat against Israel. Now, a decision that was made in Israel 10 years ago was not to let it happen. Now, in order not to let it happen, it is not enough to say we cannot tolerate it, because words are not convincing. The only thing that convinced someone, at least in this part of the world, is actions. And uh, so Israel decided to uh, attack those Iranian uh, facilities in Syria or those Iranian uh, uh, forces in Syria, and especially to try to create, I would say, uh, uh, to eliminate or to decrease significantly the abilities of those new militias in Syria to uh, to go and to become to be a very significant military force. Now, in order to do it, we had to attack targets in Syria constantly, let's say average of at least once a week, for 10 years. So for more or less 500 weeks since 2014 or 15, we constantly attack targets in Syria. Now, any attack is dangerous. Number one, because we are, we have to overcome the Syrian uh, air defense system, which sometimes managed to do something. They even shot down one Israeli aircraft some years ago. And uh, this is threat number one. Uh, the second risk is uh, to be in direct confrontation with the Russians because the Russians continue to be in Syria, and actually they give some kind of umbrella to Syria, especially in regard to the air force and air defense. And at least once we were that close to be in a complete clash with the Russians, because there was an Israeli attack uh, in Syria, and the, the Syrian anti-aircraft system uh, made a mistake. They identified a Russian aircraft as an Israeli one, and they shot it down using, by the way, Russian uh, air defense missiles. So a Russian uh, aircraft uh, with a crew of about seven people, if I'm not wrong, was shot down by the Syrians. But the Russians actually accused us. It is all happened because you attacked Syria and you created some confusion among the Syrian air defense system. And it happens uh, many times something or some events closer to this. So this is another risk. And the third risk is that uh, we understand that at some point, the Iranian might decide to attack back Israel. And that's exactly what happened a week ago when we attacked a very, very, let's say, uh, valuable target Iranian valuable targets in Damascus, the capital of Syria. We killed seven senior Iranian officers that are responsible exactly for this mission to establish a strong pro-Iranian militia in, uh, in Syria. So, so far in the past 10 or 11 years, we managed to, let's say, to contain this threat and to reduce it uh, significantly and uh, to cause the Iranian to be careful because it is not only that we say that we will do something, we actually do something. So in order to maintain ability to deter, you have to be ready to fight and to take actions. And many times it means to take risks. And if the risk is taken not in a smart way, then you might find yourself, let's say, in a bigger conflict or even in a war that you are not interested in. But if you are too careful, it means that you lose your ability to deter. So the terms is important. Now, why it was so important for Israel at that time, it's still very important today, because at least in the first 19 years of the state of Israel, until 67, Israel was a very, very small country. The borders, we will speak about borders later, uh, were not really defensible borders. And it was clear that our ability to continue and to live normal life in Israel are based very much on our ability to deter enemies. I can tell you from personal experience, I grew in a village that at that time was, let's say, 
four or five miles from the border with Jordan. Today it is the border between Israel and the West Bank. And uh, Jordan was an enemy of Israel. And uh, we were uh, just in, in, in the village, a lot of fields, nothing actually that could stop the Jordanians if they decided at that time to attack Israel. And as a child, I felt very comfortable. It is not that I understood everything that I understand right now, but we felt comfortable because we did have a feeling that the state of Israel can deter enemies, although all the enemies, actually all the countries around us at that time, were not only our enemies, but explicitly said that their goal is to destroy Israel. And so the ability to deter is very important, It is, and it is composed of the two elements. You have to be strong enough, but also you have to show courage, determination, resolve, and the readiness to project power. So this is about the first Israeli principle, the terms. The second one is to be able to have a successful or effective early warning system. Since Israel is so small and so vulnerable, again, I'm speaking specifically about the first 19 years of the country, it was clear that uh, if the enemy attack us by surprise, we might not be able to confront it. So in order to be able to be prepared, uh, we need a very, very uh, uh, advanced uh, intelligence system that can supply at least early warning for a war. And the most important mission of the Israeli intelligence, there are many, many missions of daily life, but the most important mission is to give early warning before a war begins. And at least twice, unfortunately, the Israeli intelligence failed. In 73, we spoke about that. And the second time, of course, last year on, on October 7th, uh, it is not only some small mistake or small uh, uh, failure, it is in these two cases, it is the failure in the most important mission of the Israeli intelligence, and this is to supply an effective early warning uh, ability. We will. We already spoke a few times about intelligence. We will speak more about intelligence next week, and uh, I will try to explain how intelligence system work, which is uh, quite, uh, let's say, crucial matter. Uh, but uh, certainly for Israel, intelligence has always been something extremely important. And the two things that help us to build an effective intelligence system, number one is technology. Intelligence depends more and more and more on technology. And uh, the more advanced you are in the fields of high tech and artificial intelligence and things that are connected to these worlds, the better are the chances that you will be able to know what is happening on the other side. Uh, so this is uh, a technology. Uh, for instance, if Israel is one of the first countries in the world that we have uh, intelligent satellite, the satellite can watch from above and see what is happening in every part of the world or every area of interest. And you can see and identify in real time when let's say some divisions of the enemy or some aircrafts of the enemy are moving from one place to another. So this is based on technology. If you don't have this technology, then you are, cannot be as effective. Uh, and the second uh, element that was very, very helpful for Israel in the first years, today less and less, uh, Israel is a country of immigrants. There are people in Israel who came from tens of countries and uh, they are still many, many people who speak other language, not only Hebrew, as their mother tongue. And of course, since there were so many Israelis who were born in Arab countries and they spoke fluent Arabic, or they were born in Iran who spoke uh, perfect uh, Persian, or they were born in the Soviet Union and they spoke fluent uh, Russian, etc. All these kind of abilities, uh, of course, uh, were very helpful. So the second principle, as I said, is the ability to supply an early warning in real time. And the third element uh, was to be able to achieve a decisive win in short time. Again, Israel of the 50s or Israel of the 60s, very small country of about, let's say, 1 million people, or at some point, maybe 2 million people, 
uh, doesn't have a lot of natural resources, does not have a lot of resources. Uh, we live in an area that we are surrounded by enemies. And uh, in order to uh, survive, we cannot tolerate a long attrition war. We have to be able to win the enemy in a decisive way. And to win an enemy in, decisive, uh, in a decisive and clear way means that the, uh, the uh, operational concept should be offensive. And just to remind you, we spoke about that in one of the previous classes. We make a distinction between the strategy and the operational level. I just, I'm saying it again, it is important. When you have offensive strategy, or if you want offensive policy, it means that you are not satisfied with the current situation and you want to change it. Yeah. Hitler adopted a very clear offensive strategy. And he decided that time was that time has come to change the borders, to change the territory, to change the regime in Europe. So he decided that time has come to change it. So when you are not satisfied with the current situation, you are choosing an offensive strategy. Defensive strategy is uh, when you are um, you are content or you can live with the current situation. You don't want to change it, but you want to maintain it and to keep it intact. This is about strategy. But regardless of the strategy, when we go to the operational level, uh, we also can speak about offensive uh, operation doctrine and defensive one. And offensive means that even if we are in strategic defensive mode, we don't want to change the situation, we are happy. But if we are attacked, it is not enough for us to defend ourselves. We want to move as far as fast as possible to the offense in order to achieve a clear victory. So this was the policy of the state of Israel to a certain extent still today. And these were the three principles of the state of Israel that officially uh, were, let's say, the the headlines of the the, the 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 very very basic foundation for all for uh, for whatever we did since then. Uh, in two thousand and six, uh, there was a committee that uh, again. Uh, made some kind of a reassessment about the Israeli strategy. I was a member of this committee, and uh, we decided to add another element to these three principles, not to change any of them, but to add another one. And this is a simple defense. In other words, we decided that uh, uh, we cannot move immediately from, uh, let's say, early warning and then the war begins, and then we immediately we attack. We have to understand that we have to improve our defensive system. And there were many reasons for that. One of the crucial reasons for that, which is still relevant today, and the need is even growing and growing, is that many, many, many of our enemies, whether they are state or non-state actors, do have different missiles or rockets or UAVs that can attack the Israeli, uh, not only the Israeli front, but also the Israeli rear. They can attack civilian infrastructure. So it is not enough that we uh, have a great operational abilities or uh, offensive abilities. If we do want to survive and we do want to be able to, let's say, to carry out later some kind of successful attack, we have to improve our defensive system. This is also a lesson from the war in 73. Israel at that time was prepared to attack our enemies, but we were not well prepared to, uh, to absorb an attack of the Syrian and the Egyptians. We made a lot of mistakes. We did not have the right systems. And we understand that uh, although the main operational doctrine is an offensive one, uh, we have to give much more emphasis to this. And now I'm coming to the last point in this part of the class. Um, and this is uh, a new ideas that began to emerge in the past six months, whether or not we have to add another principle, another pillar. And it is a, a decision to take 
preventive measures against enemies or even potential enemies if we understand that this potential threat uh, might cause us an existential threat. And I will explain. Until actually formally now, Israel decided to carry out a preventive attack against enemy capability was also only in regard to nuclear abilities of enemies. We understood that if one of our enemies has a nuclear military abilities, this might create an immediate existential threat to the state of Israel. So we cannot wait until such a ability is developed in that other country, but we have to take actions in order to destroy it in advance, to prevent it. And uh, so far, the uh, understanding in Israel was that there, are, there is only one kind of existential threat to the state of Israel, and this is nuclear abilities of our enemies. There are many, many other threats, but they are not existential. And Israel attacked twice a nuclear facilities in our countries. The first one was in 81. We attacked uh, uh, the Iraqi nuclear reactor in Baghdad. The name of the reactor was Osirak. It was built by whom? Who supplied these nuclear abilities to Saddam Hussein in Iraq in 81? The French. It was a French reactor, and we actually, it was a very successful airstrike carried out by eight Israeli aircraft in June 81, and it was completely destroyed. And the second time that we did something similar was in Syria in 2007, when the Syrian managed to build in a very, very confidential way a nuclear facility in the eastern part of the country. And uh, a similar airstrike was carried out in that year in 2007. And again, this facility was totally destroyed. But these were actually the only real cases in which we uh, uh, made a decision to, uh, to, to use, let's say, a preventive measures Although what I just explained about Syria in the past 10 years is also some kind of preventive measures. Now, again, I want to explain or to say again, what is the difference between preventive action and preemptive action? Preventive action, the goal is to prevent military abilities of the enemy. Maybe the enemy produced certain ability, the enemy still does not have any intent to use it. Nevertheless, uh, we cannot tolerate the existence of such ability on the other side, so we take a preventive measure, uh, in simple words, just to prevent this kind of ability. A preemptive strike is something different. Preemptive strike means that if I know that the enemy is going to attack me in a matter of few days or sometimes even few hours, and I know that it is, he is going to do it, and I don't want to give him the advantage of being the first one to strike, then I decide to strike before he strikes me. And this is a preemptive. Uh, for instance, uh, unfortunately on October 7th, we had no clue that uh, Hamas was planning to do what they did. But let's assume that if we knew about that a few hours before, we could take a preemptive action in order to attack all the areas where they concentrated the forces. So going back to this uh, list today, uh, some people suggest that we have to add here five and to say the following. Whenever the enemy is not a state, but a non-state actor, it could be Hamas, it could be uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, it could be other potential non-state actors, but that threaten us. We cannot tolerate the existence of such a threat 
and of course not the fact that this threat is growing and growing and growing. So we have to take actions. Even if there is a complete calm, the enemy does not intend to attack you in the short or the foreseeable future, the foreseeable future then we have to do whatever we can in order to prevent this potential threat. Actually, discussions about that began to be very uh, relevant in Israel a few years ago in regard to Hezbollah in the north. We spoke about Hezbollah, previous class or two classes before, um, and uh, Hezbollah has a huge amount of rockets and missiles. This is something that actually we don't like. It does create a lot of threat. But uh, most of the missiles and the rockets until recently were statistic weapons. Statistic weapons means that if they launch, let's say, a rocket from Lebanon to Tel Aviv, and they want to hit a specific target over here, then uh, uh, usually in Pizuru TV, Distribution of the uh, uh, then it might fall in a, in a radius of uh, more or less two kilometers. So even if they want to attack a specific building over here or specific facility, uh, there is very very uh, slim chances that they will be able to hit the specific target. So it is a matter of about two kilometers that you will fall here and there. And the uh, distance of two kilometers means that it is not precise weapon, it is a statistic. But unfortunately, uh, Hezbollah, again, based on Iranian technology, managed to develop uh, three kind of weapons that can be very precise. The first one is UAVs. UAVs with uh, ammunition that they can be sent the UAV. Uh, to what we call to carry out a suicide attack. I mean, the UAV will fall or crash on some targets. It is very precise, uh, but it is not that terrible because usually the, 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 the size of the explosives is very small. It can vary between, I don't know, 10 kilo to maximum 50 kilo. Uh, again, if it hits some in, uh, sensitive target, it will cause a damage but it is relatively, uh, let's say, small damage. And besides, the UAVs are very slow, and usually our defensive system can cope with them quite effectively. The second one, the second kind of uh, more advanced weapons that they have is they manage to take their ordinary ballistic missiles that were statistic and attach to them a GPS uh, element that make this uh, missile from a statistic one to a very precise or accurate one with accuracy of about 10 meters. So there is a huge difference between two kilometers to 10 meters. 10 meters, it means that if they want to destroy this building, they will destroy this building. Maybe not necessarily hit this window, but other window, but the building will be. Hit. And these missiles, many of them are very big that can carry uh, 200, 300, even up, up to a half a ton of explosives. So when they hit a target, the damage, the expected damage is going to be very high. Uh, so this is a much more significant one. And the third kind of uh, new weapons that they have is cruise missiles. Now in explanation, what is the difference between cruise missile and ballistic missile? Ballistic missile is a missile that uh, is launched, let's say from this area, it goes like this and it hits the target. And uh, if it is, if we're speaking about very, very long range, then uh, it will go, let's say something like this, and this is even above the atmosphere. It will go outside the air and return back to hit the target. This is a ballistic missile. <coughs> The advantage from the defensive side is that you can identify uh, the root of the missile. You can calculate where exactly it might fall, and you and please Israel has some good defensive system that can intercept them. Usually, the interception is is done here, far away from Israel. And uh, the longer is the, 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 the root of the missile, 
the more are the chances that we will be able to intercept it. And uh, many times we shoot uh, two anti-missile missiles. So if the first one uh, misses, then the second one will hit it here. But as I began to say, the third kind of weapons besides the UAVs and besides the uh, ballistic missiles is the cruise missile. What is a cruise missile? A cruise missile is actually, if you want, uh, uh, a kind of uh, unmanned uh, advanced aircraft that can fly uh, very quickly in the speed uh, of uh, something like 700 uh, kilometers an hour. This is more or less the speed of a jet that flies, let's say, from Israel to New York. 700 square, uh, kilometers an hour, 800 kilometers an hour. This is more or less the speed of uh, of, uh, of modern uh, aircraft. So they can fly, let's say, very, very quickly. More important, they can fly just above the ground. So the radars cannot detect them. Because in order to have ability of radar to see the target, to, to detect the target, you need to have a line of sight. So if they do it, uh, let's say, in a very, very low altitude, it means that the radars might not see it, or at least not see it uh, early enough. <laughs> and the third problem with the cruise missiles is that they can maneuver. They can maneuver, which means, let's say, that uh, this is where the launcher is there. And let's say that uh, this is the target. And uh, let's say that there are hills here, or mountains over here, and mountains over here, and mountains over here. Then those who are launched the missile can uh, plan it to go something like this. So only in a very, very low altitude, the maneuver between the hills. So, uh, so if the radar of the defense is only is here, then it can identify the missile only when it comes, let's say, to be very close to the target, which is very dangerous. Number two, in a moment, uh, of course, to be able to intercept the missile that flies in a, in a speed of 700 kilometers, or sometimes even more, could be even 1,000 kilometer, you have to have either a very, very, very advanced anti-missile defensive system, or you need to use your own aircraft with air-to-air -air missiles to actually to uh, to launch a missile from the Israeli airport, air, 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 um, aircraft to the missile. It is actually like a real modern aircraft, but it is not manned. And this kind of cruise missile can carry, uh, can carry with them hundreds of kilos of explosives. So these are very dangerous weapons. And uh, Hezbollah, in the past three or four years, uh, began to be equipped with all kinds of these new weapons. Now, the real question that was under discussion in Israel was the following one. Uh, what is the critical mess of the number of uh, advanced weapons or precise weapons that will be in the hands of Hezbollah that we cannot tolerate? Let's assume that they have now, all in all, 50 missiles that are accurate or precise weapons. So let's say 50 is fine. We can cope with 50. And even if some of them would be able to penetrate our defensive system, the damage is not going to cause a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic, uh, let's say, disaster in Israel. Now, what happens if they have 500? Can we live with 500 of uh, weapons like this? Or maybe we cannot. And if you say, yes, we can live with 500, then we can also say, what happens if there are 5,000? Now, if you say, for instance, that you know how to live with 500, but you cannot tolerate 5,000, it means that in this point, before the 500 becomes 5,000, then you have to take a preventive measure, or you have to begin a preventive war, just because you do want to prevent these uh, military capabilities to go. This is a real dilemma. 
And after the last event, October 7th, some people suggest, just as is written here, intolerance toward enemies' force building. Of course, if the enemy has just another rifles and another, I don't know, small uh, primitive weapons, it is not uh, referring to this element. We are referring, of course, to uh, weapons that can really risk or threaten the state of Israel. And uh, of course, if we decide formally and practically that this element should be added to the Israeli doctrine, it means that no matter what is happening, for instance, between Israel and Hezbollah today, and even if a ceasefire is achieved today uh, between Israel and Hezbollah and the exchange of fire between both sides uh, stop, then it might be not enough because we, some people say we cannot live under this continuous possible threat and wait until they decide uh, to, 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 to take actions against us. So this element is very important. And why I make a distinction between a state and non-state actors? Because usually states are more responsible, are more accountable, they have more to lose if they begin something against you because whatever they do, you will do uh, against them. So many times you can reach a mutual deterrence with, uh, let's say, uh, states. But whenever we speak about non-state actors, uh, usually they are less responsible, less accountable, uh, less concerned about the damage to the country where they operate from, and uh, it just leads you to maybe to make such a decision. If I uh, look at an other part of the Middle East, if we look at Yemen, for example, and uh, this non-state actor in Yemen that actually uh, threatened the all uh, naval uh, transportation. Uh, it is not necessarily only Israel problem, it is probably an international problem. And maybe this is one of the decisions that the, that the international community should uh, make, or at least the West, and say we cannot tolerate the existence of non-state actor that has such a strategic weapons, and it is up to him to decide when it will be calm or when it will be dangerous. So this is about the principles. So to sum up, in the first years of Israel, officially until 2006, we had three main principles. Uh, this is the deterrence, the importance of early warning, and the ability to achieve a decisive win. From 2006, we added the defense, Unfortunately, we failed to implement it on October 7th. 